Hello and welcome to Sea Trade Cruise Talks. We're back with another episode. Sea Trade Cruise Talks is a series of educational content featuring cruise professionals and industry leaders discussing the challenges and opportunities of the current and future industry climate. You can sponsor a talk to align your brand with innovative thinking and recent trends and to receive highly relevant, engaged leads that are seeking the sort of value your brand provides. Contact us at sales at seatradecruise.com or find us on socials at seatradecruise. And don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to our channel for weekly talks content. Hello and welcome to Sea Trade Cruise Ports and Destinations Ambassador Updates with me, Holly Payne, Editor of Video Production and Deputy Editor at Sea Trade Cruise. Introducing our three Sea Trade Cruise Ambassadors and founding members of the Cruise Professionals Advisors Alliance, Roger Bloom, Principal at Cruise and Port Advisors. Yanis Brass, CEO, Five Senses Consulting Group and award-winning cruise destination developer. And Shannon McKee, President at Access Cruise, co-founder at Zelia and Managing Director at Banana Coast Tours. Welcome, everybody. Thanks, Holly. Thank you. Hi, Holly. Now, first up, we're going to start with an icebreaker. So can I ask, where is the last place you traveled and what was your favorite part of the trip? Yanis, why don't you start us off? Yeah, and I have a good one for you. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, it was a very well-deserved uh, small break in the island of Kefalonia in Greece. And the thing I enjoyed most was the beautiful beaches. Uh, we made it... Uh, uh, a target to visit all the beaches uh, in the island on, on the, the four days we were there. Uh, it was amazing. It was spectacular. Uh, we posted a lot of photos on, on Instagram and we want to go back. It's a beautiful island and uh, I so very much loved it. I'm going to have to check out those photos on Instagram, Yanis. Sounds fantastic. Shannon? So I just returned from our summer holidays and we were in Italy for almost three weeks and it was phenomenal. And, you know, we traveled all over. We were in Rome, we were in Pompeii, we were in Florence and Venice and Cormayor. So we were all over. But I have to say that the first time I ever went to Italy, I was 18 years old and I fell in love with Florence and the love is still there. It's still one of my absolute favorite cities to just wander. And on my very last day, I was trying to convince my daughter. I'm like, come on, let's just go back to Florence one more time, one more day, come on, we can do this. So I would have to say that Florence, again, is just one of my favorites and always has been. Oh, wow. I mean, Italy, what a treasure. The only problem is deciding where to go. It's, it's full of amazing places. There's so many things to do there. There's just never enough time. Roger was trying to convince me yesterday that I should just rent a house and then he and Marie can come and stay with us. And Giannis, uh, you guys can come and stay with us. We'll just have a big party, right? And Giannis can barbecue. <laughs> Definitely. You didn't invite the kids. <laughs> yes, even the kids. <laughs> and Roger, what about you? Well, I just, my wife and I just came back from New York and Chicago. We went up to see our kids who both have internships. One is in uh, New York, the other is in Chicago. So the favorite part of the trip, obviously, was spending time with our kids. Um, but what was interesting about the trip, and I'm sure we all are living it, and obviously it's on the news, is how expensive everything is now. So between the flights, the hotel, the rental car, the gas, or for, for you, Holly, the petrol, um, the uh, food, the seeing Broadway shows, it's really expensive. And it made us appreciate the value of taking a cruise. And I think as prices are going up and there's talk about recession, whatever, the value of a cruise is just can't be beat. Um, you know how much it's going to cost you up front, you budget whatever it's going to be for drinks or gambling or spa, and you know what it's going to cost. Whereas this trip, which was an easy trip to, to go to New York and Chicago, unlike the exotic trips that uh, Shannon and Giannis have taken, <laughs> it, it really makes you appreciate cruising. And I think uh, that value proposition, the cruise industry has been preaching it forever, and we've got to get the word out. It's, it's definitely in a time like this, it's the way to go. I agree. Absolutely. Excellent advice. Um, 
which brings me on to my first question around new and emerging destinations. Have you seen any new destinations on your radar who you think might become a featured port of call on itineraries? What do you think, Shannon? You know, there's there's a lot of new and emerging destinations. It's interesting because I, I think back sometimes to when Costa Maya first launched um, so many years ago, and it was this destination, and, and they really worked hard to bring the cruise ships in as an alternative, and people thought, why would anybody go there? But now it's this, it's this bustling port that is featured on so many itineraries, and it became because they were looking for alternatives, right? Um, as the itinerary planners are looking for new ports because of the congestion in certain ports, there are these new and emerging ports that are popping up and they start off small, right? And some of them are, are small because they're looking more for the expedition brands that are coming through. Um, but I think that we are going to see more of these customized cruise ports developing out throughout the world. I mean, we see new ports developing in the Emirates region. We see new ports developing um, out in, in, in Asia and in China. Um, you know, we see alternative ports popping up um, because of the congestion. Let's say in Copenhagen, you have, uh, you know, ports around there that are now trying to attract the cruise lines as an alternative. So I think it's super exciting uh, to watch the marketplace. I mean, they estimated that there's close to almost 3,000 ports out there. Now we know the 80-20 rule that, you know, probably 20% of the ports are getting the majority of, of the business. But I think as the cruise industry continues to grow more ships on the high seas, we're going to see some of these alternative ports popping up and emerging into that top 20% where they're gonna to start to see a lot more cruise calls. So Alaska is another one where we see a lot of new ports starting to develop and emerge um, because of the traffic and the congestion in the, in the major ports. If I might, I might add to what uh, Shannon said, Holly, uh, which I fully, fully agree. Uh, if we see the numbers, uh, I mean, we were restart year last year, stabilization year, this year, uh, development from next year in, in cruise. And uh, with whatever has happened with, you know, for ships going to scrap or she's been sold, we see strong new builds coming out this year, next year, and uh, up to 2027, I think 80 more ships or so coming out, which is very important. So what Shannon said that the congestion is leading the cruise lines and also the COVID effect in terms of wanting people to go to places which is not as crowded perhaps, or they want to discover new places uh, again, that will lead to on search for new destinations. So uh, I always say, you know, wherever I talk and through this, you know, there's opportunities there for destinations. Get out there, find someone professional to assist you uh, and get your qualities out there. You should, you should, you should target though, specific cruise lines, not all, yes. all the ports are for the cruise lines, obviously. And, but, uh, you know, you're the first, uh, as Shannon and I sometimes say, the first call is the most difficult, but there are opportunities out there. So go get them. I'd like to just throw in there too, Holly, that, um, you know, I agree with, of course, everything that Shannon and Yana said. Um, and in particular, with the ships being built, and there's still a lot of ships being built, and we know the ships have been retired over the last couple of years, um, but the ships being built are anything from the 6,000 passenger, you know, giant ships to the 100 passenger expedition ships, and the need for thousands of additional port calls per year. Um, and these port calls can't all be at these marquee ports. So they need, the, you know, these destinations need to develop and to offer it. And to go along with what Yana said, it's very important to understand if you're a destination or port, who you're right for. Because yeah. every cruise line is looking for something different. Their guests are looking for something different. The ships are, are, are different, not just physically and what they can do on a nautical basis, but what they want in a guest experience. And that's probably everybody has something to offer, but you need to know what you have to offer to be able to uh, offer a, an authentic experience that really makes sense for your destination as well as for your visitors. That's a great point, Roger. Ultimately, you know, it all comes down to the customer experience, doesn't it? So, you know, thanks so much for, for that insight. Um, from your travels, have you seen anything unique 
from a port or destination to enhance the customer experience. Um, a flash mob performing classic local songs for cruise passengers at Naples Springs, to my mind. What do you think, Roger? I saw the video of that and it, it was just absolutely fantastic. Um, I just mentioned the word authentic and naturally th the number one thing for any destination is you have to offer an authentic experience and equally as important, you have to offer a memorable experience. So the flash mob in Naples definitely was memorable. There is no question that that was a memorable experience as far as authentic the music was authentic. What they do, uh, Finiculi, Finiculi, whatever, and Osola Mio. So the music was authentic. But quite honestly, they can't do that every time a ship is in because they'll have thousands of cruise ship guests standing in the terminal waiting for the flash mob every day. So it has to be something that really is authentic and something more natural. Um, I've seen some really interesting welcomes to cruise ships. And let, let's start with one that was very simple and started many years ago in St. John, New Brunswick. They were just so excited to get cruise ships there that the locals turned out, and this was supported by um, tourism in the port and um, Betty McMillan, who I think many of us watching all know Betty, um, that they gave a flower to everybody arriving. And locals were there, adults, um, handing out flowers just to welcome people to their community. So that was a very welcoming type of experience. Uh, one of my clients, um, Martinique, is in the Caribbean, and we're surrounded by, it's a French island surrounded by English islands. And I'm a fan of reggae. I'm a fan of Bob Marley. But on a Caribbean cruise, you go to island to island, and you do get this reggae feel and music when you come in. Whereas when you arrive in Martinique, it's a soon as you get off the ship you know it's a different experience they have it's different music obviously because of the french creole culture of the island the music is different they have dancers there in um, creole costumes and they're taking people by the hand not if they don't want to people are dancing there's music there there's costumes um they have tourist guides uh stationed all around the city and red vests just to help people feel welcome um it's important to make it an easy experience for people, make it memorable, have things that people can take pictures of and post. Yamas just mentioned Instagram. Uh, in the olden days, people would go on vacation and then you'd be invited over to their house to look at their slides and fall asleep. Now, when somebody shows up at your destination, the good news isn't just that they're going to go home and talk to their friends about it. They're going to post these experiences. So things that are also visual and that can be posted it, it, you know, that you get not tenfold, you get hundreds per person of different views, thousands of views. And it needs to, again, to go back to the authentic and memorable and something that people can post, let them share this. People want to be able to share photos and videos and whatever from their vacations more so than to show their Gucci handbag now. So this is the <laughs> takeaway, they, you know, do, do stuff like that, make it memorable, make it something that people can talk about, make it authentic and make it postable. By the way, right. just to throw in with that, I've even seen ports where they've had the school kids lined up welcoming um, welcoming the visitors ashore, and people get so excited, the little kids are all excited, they're welcoming the tourists. And Giannis mentioned one other thing, one is the welcome, the other is the farewell. There's yeah. many destinations, and I might say most destinations, they might do a nice welcome, but when everyone's coming back to the ship, and there's a big flow of people coming back to the ship, besides for going through the um, x-ray or whatever type of security, that's it. To have also some type of a festivity to say, we're glad you've been here, we hope you come back. That's also very memorable. And people are lying the decks when ships are sailing. You know, do something also to say goodbye and say, please come back. Yes, I mean, it really means a lot to have that human interaction. Um, don't you think, Roger, especially now after these difficult years we've had, I feel that people really cherish this personal touch. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think that's what differentiates destinations. And I think that's the most memorable part of any trip is really the people you meet. And um, yeah, I, Holly, you, you said it yourself, that's, that is the most memorable and the most important is the people. Now, from a, a topic with lots of solutions, as you've explained, um, to one with some challenges, um, I'd like to look at fuels. Now, research shows hydrogen may be a big player in the future. 
And I was interested recently um, that Tui Cruz's Mind Shift 7, although initially running on low sulfur fuel, is being built with the capability of using green methanol in the future. Now, Roger, have you heard any interesting takes on alternative fuels? Well, first of all, right now, the, uh, there's a whole bunch of ships coming out with LNG. So LNG is a giant step forward, but everyone agrees it's not the end solution. It still is a fossil fuel. Um, so the, the effort is to move away from fossil fuels into renewable energies. Um, hydrogen, for instance, it is a great solution, and I'm far from an expert on this, but one of the challenges with hydrogen is most hydrogen today is made using fossil fuels. So to make hydrogen, you need to do it with renewable energy or else it's, it's still not gonna solve anything. Plus the volume and the capacity for hydrogen is, is still very low. But since you are talking about the future, hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cells, um, hybrid ships are coming out now, better batteries, um, all of this type of stuff is coming out. One thing that I will credit the cruise industry for, which I credit them for many things, of course, but over the last two, two and a half years, they've kind of had their hands full focusing on what we all know everybody's been focusing on, COVID. But during that period, their efforts towards um, the decarbonization and uh, net zero and all of this didn't seem to miss a beat. They kept working towards this. And it's not that any of these are quick, easy solutions, but they haven't stopped. There wasn't a pause for two and a half years saying, okay, let's, let's figure out our money, let's figure out COVID, let's figure out protocols, all of this stuff that they've been dealing with. Their teams have still been working within the international scientific community, through the IMO, through all, all of these organizations. One thing that is good, because I am not an expert, but I was looking at the C-Trade Malaga um, conference schedule, and there is a session on alternative fuels that I'm really interested to go to because as much as I read this stuff from the surface, um, that looks like it's gonna be a fascinating session to really get into this and for the sustainable future, not just of the cruise industry of the world, this is where we've got to go. So um, I'm really looking forward to learning a lot more about this in Malaga in September. That's excellent Good to hear. I, I, I mean, Holly, there's not a simple answer uh, as Roger put it, I think there's going to be a combination of solutions and technologies, uh, you know, and as Roger said it, uh, I'm proud of this industry that has been developing and spending money on research. Uh, the same thing happens for passenger ships, you know, they have the same problem with fueling prices and everything, but um, new technologies have been uh, developed as we speak, uh, using the wind, using the sun, using mixed technologies, better batteries, which is some of the shore power, of course, is a big thing. and this is uh, what we now should be targeting for the ports to install facilities so the new ships can come in and, and, and you know, use a clean, fresh power from shore, not using their own. All this can assist, but definitely this is a, a sector that will uh, have a lot of development in the next years. And this is something which also the destination should be looking because as and if they're smart and, and you know, go faster and, and invest on something on that region, there will be another plus for attracting the newer ships and the more business to the port. Mm, thank you, Yanis. And, and I hope, as Roger mentioned, that um, you know, at Sea Trade Cruise Med, that there'll be some insight on this that you know, we'll be able to share with people too.